Welcome back, guys, to the JPS podcast, and this episode is a listener Q&A. Some of the topics discussed in this Q&A episode are how to deal with low motivation, whether or not everyone has the potential to compete, the best exercises for quad hypertrophy, whether or not creatine contributes to accelerated hair loss, what the role of increasing calories has on weight loss and energy availability, also discussed are some questions relating to opening a facility, strength loss when cutting, as well as how to approach dieting over the festive season, and finally, progressive overload and volume. So this will be the final podcast episode for 2018. Thank you all for listening and tuning in. I do really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to bringing plenty more guests on in the future to help spread solid information to you guys to help you with your own fitness endeavors. So let's get into things and I hope you guys enjoy this listener Q&A. Welcome back guys to the JPS podcast and on this episode we have a listener Q&A. So to those of you who submitted some questions to me whether it was on Instagram, Facebook or email, thank you very very much. I thought the questions were absolutely brilliant and I'm excited to get into those today. To those of you who submitted questions that I'm not going to have time to answer, I will respond to you privately with uh, my thoughts and comments on those questions and hopefully I'll be able to uh, answer them appropriately for you. Without further ado, let's get into things. So the first question I have is from Tamara and she asks, how to tackle a situation where you can feel a client's motivation dropping? For example, they stop sending progress pictures, they're not checking in or only coming to train when they have scheduled personal training sessions. So this is a really common issue for many people, both coaches and lifters. Motivation's going to fluctuate quite a lot throughout somebody's training career. There's going to be periods where they have high motivation and they're not going to have any issues sticking to their diet or training. And then there are going to be periods where motivation is lower and they're just not feeling it. There are a multitude of factors that can influence our motivation, our seasons being one of them, especially with uh, you know, the winter when it's cold. This can make uh, training a lot more difficult. It can then have a cascade of effects on somebody's dietary adherence and compliance to the plan. But nonetheless, I think it's important to understand that when motivation is high, we need to capitalize on it and aim to make as much progress as possible. So we want to get a couple of steps ahead and see progression in whatever it is the client's goal is, whatever your goal is, uh, to make sure that you do get ahead so that when those periods of low motivation do come about, you can taper down the training, the, the diet, and you can set in place a plan that can at least maintain uh, the individual's you know, strength and muscle adaptations or their body weight and they don't go too far backwards because motivation will climb again soon hopefully and then you can start to progress forward and remember it's always easier to maintain uh, anything that we achieve than it is to develop it in the first place so when motivation is high I really like to aim for progress and to push things in the right direction as much as possible so that when low motivation does come about, we're simply aiming to maintain and we can have a much more uh, user-friendly approach to how we structure things. But in those periods of low motivation, I think it's important to, to be pliable, adjust your expectations and don't try to fight it when it's just not there. You might need to adapt the plan, make things a little more uh, flexible, whether it's the nutrition or the training, and just try to keep things ticking along so that you're not going backwards. It, it's very much a case-by-case -case basis when I'm working with an individual because there's going to be a specific factor that's influencing their motivation, whether it's injury, it could be the weather, it could be the increase in their stress from work, whatever the case may be. Priorities changing, lots of things, but Generally speaking, uh, you just need to be flexible and keep the client in the game, keep yourself in the game, and just be mindful of what it is that's hindering uh, your motivation, your ability to adhere to the plan, and do your best to 
address that so that you can put yourself in a position uh, to pick things back up and train as you need to to achieve your goals. So I hope I answered that question tomorrow. Another question I had from tomorrow was, do you think everyone has the potential to compete if they put in enough work? And I usually don't allow people to ask two questions, but I couldn't help uh, but want to answer this one because I think it's very common for people to want to compete in physique and get on stage, but not many individuals actually think critically about this decision. So firstly, I think that everybody has the potential to get on stage. You don't have to be lean to get on stage or register for a bodybuilding competition. So for sure, anyone can compete. But does that mean they'll be competitive? Well, that depends. It depends on a number of things. And firstly, it's going to depend on the division that they're competing in. For example, if somebody wants to compete in a bikini show, they're not going to require a lot of years of hard training. They can hold a little bit more body fat, and it's very much a, a glamour show. Whereas if somebody wants to compete in bodybuilding, well, that's a different story. They're going to need to get significantly leaner. They're going to need to have more muscle, which means more time training the gym, and genetics will play a much larger role in how well uh, somebody can handle themselves when dieting down to extremely low levels of body fats, as well as their uh, potential for muscularity. So whether or not someone's competitive is generally a function of their body fat percentage, their muscularity, and their genetics. And competing, looking good on stage, and ticking the boxes of the prerequisites for a specific division aren't that difficult if you have the requisite know-how in terms of applying principles of nutrition and training. So being able to navigate through a calorie deficit and get someone leaner over time and retaining as much muscle as possible and then off seasons, hopefully they've built the muscle in the first place. But being elite is a completely different uh, animal. To be elite in bodybuilding or physique, that's going to largely come down to time and experience, so how long somebody's training for consistently and building muscle over many, many years, as well as their genetics. Because when we're talking about the elite level of physique competitors, we're splitting hairs and they're typically going to have better insertions and muscle bellies. Uh, their bone structures are going to be suited to the divisions that they're in, all those sorts of things. So how do you know if you can compete? Well, you just simply have to have an honest and objective assessment of your physique, uh, your dieting experience, as well as your training experience. Because there's no point going into a contest prep if you haven't been able to diet successfully before and maintain that weight for some period of time. If you haven't built any muscle or been able to train consistently, it's, it's gonna be a disaster, really. So make sure that you have a really, really thorough assessment of where you're at with your training and your physique development. And then also determine what your expectations are. If you're wanting to get on stage because it's the next logical step in your training career, then go for it. And if you meet the criteria of having dieted successfully, you've got some sufficient muscle mass, then I don't see why not, provided you have a reasonably healthy relationship with food and body, you've thought about it, you've done your homework, why not? However, if you're competing and you're expecting to be elite and you want to win pro cards and win shows, but you haven't met the aforementioned criteria, then maybe it's not the right thing for you. It might be better to just continue to train and set other goals outside of competing in your physique because a contest prep can be a pretty dark and scary place for many individuals. And if it's not approached with diligence, then it can do more harm than good. So yeah, I think if anyone is willing to work hard, they can get on stage, but there's a few caveats to that. I hope I answer that one for you tomorrow. Question number three. Curious as to your opinion on how safety bar squats, front squats, and hack squats stack up to each other for quad hypertrophy. So this was from Incredible Bulk on Instagram. I love that handle. So firstly, when we look to the quads, they perform two functions primarily. One is knee extension and the other is uh, hip flexion. So it's important to remember what causes muscle growth is mechanical tension. So that is 
uh, exposure to sufficient magnitudes of tension under uh, t sufficient duress. <clears throat> and that requires sufficient exposure to uh, the stress of, and the magnitude and duration of tension uh, that will allow the most amount of motor units to be recruited under fatigue conditions. So you're going to have to lift heavy and train through a bit of pain for the most part. But what's really important when assessing what exercise is going to be best to build muscle uh, is that muscle growth is a tension dependent process, not an exercise dependent process. So your muscles are just a dumb piece of meat. They don't know what exercise you're performing. They're simply going to respond to that tension stimulus. So when it comes to building bigger legs and quads, my experience and understanding of both muscle growth and biomechanics uh, has led me to the viewpoint that the best multi-joint lift uh, for quad growth will be an exercise that allows you to achieve deep hip flexion without pain or discomfort or any compensatory movement, so without leaning forward excessively or losing upper back tightness or having your erectors uh, be overly involved in the movement, so on and so forth, uh, whilst allowing you to lift the greatest absolute loads. So for many individuals, this is going to be a function of their individual orthopedic profile, their leverages, their mobility and stability of certain joints. So it's not really a case of which exercise is better. It's very much going to be context and individual dependent. Uh, so whether it's a high bar, low bar, safety bar, front squats, leg press or hack squats, uh, all these movements have quite similar biomechanics. Uh, and again, they're training the primary functions of the quads, which are knee extension and hip flexion. So the lift you click with, the one that you gel with and feel really comfortable performing, and again, allows you to get into a position where you're in deep hip flexion and you don't have pain, you can use a serious amount of weights, uh, that's going to be the one that's going to allow you to achieve the best gains. So dude, I hope I answered that one for you. Question number four. What's your opinion on studies that have found creatine to contribute to accelerated hair loss? So this was a little bit of a left of field question, but I wanted to include it to highlight a few important uh, points about reading research and understanding uh, science. But I'll answer the question firstly, and I'm not going to claim to be an expert in this field, and I'm not too familiar with the research, but I did some digging, checked out examine.com, great resource for you guys when it comes to supplements, and dihydro dihydrotestosterone, so DHT is a derivative of testosterone uh, that's known as being more potent at signaling through androgen receptors uh, which are involved in hair loss. So DHT and genetics will play a predominant role in male pattern hair loss. So there's only one study that has examined uh, creatine and DHT and the link between uh, those two factors and it was in males and there's many others uh, that have shown that creatine doesn't affect testosterone levels. And since DHT is a metabolite of testosterone, uh, there is some doubt that creatine really increases DHT. So as it stands, there's no studies directly examining creatine and hair loss. Uh, so we can't say for certain whether it does or not. If you are genetically predisposed to hair loss, maybe, but I'm not 100% certain uh, at this stage and I'm not confident in giving a response. But more importantly, what I wanted to discuss and why I included this question in the Q&A was that when we look at research, we need to recognize the hierarchy of evidence. So understanding that not all studies are created equally. We have some areas of research with decades and decades of high quality investigations such as energy bumps. And then we have other areas with lower level research where there might be only one or two studies that are poorly controlled, uh, they're not determining cause and effect, their observational or longitudinal studies, whatever the case may be. And this is going to really determine how much weight and stock we put into uh, the findings of this body of research. So we need to make sure that we take the findings of a single study with a grain of salt and always look to the entire body of literature. And in the instance where there's only one or two studies like the creatine uh, and its effects on hair loss, we need to be wary of believing that to be 100% true. So again, reserve your uh, beliefs and how much emphasis you're going to put into that study until more research comes to light. And finally, I just want to point out that when you're looking into these sorts of things, be resourceful. So practice tr not trying to find the right answer or asking people who are not uh, 
specifically involved uh, in the research or the specific topic that you're looking to know more about. So find a better way of getting information. And whilst I'm very humbled that you asked me to answer this question, I am not an expert in the field and there's a lot of fabulous resources out there like examine.com uh, and potentially other uh, people who would be well versed with this kind of literature. So make sure that you uh, ask them in future. And just remember that good thinkers have an amazing way of getting to an answer. So don't look for the right answers. Think about how you can ask better questions and be more uh, diligent in how you're looking for information. Question number five, increasing calories and weight loss. Is this more common in females and is energy availability as studied by Anne Lux uh, valid? So this was from Facunda Sasson. No idea how to pronounce that, I apologize. So firstly, let's address increasing calories and weight loss. Now, this isn't any magic metabolic voodoo. Uh, it's simply a case of people starting to adhere a little bit better once the calories are raised. And when the calories are raised, they're at an energy deficit because if you're raising calories and you're at surplus, you're not going to be losing weight. So simply what happens is many people will try to diet on overly restrictive uh, or extreme uh, calorie deficits and they can't adhere to it. They might even be misreporting, so they'll follow the diet for a couple of days and then binge. And then when their calories are raised, it's a lot more sustainable and achievable. They start reporting properly and they don't binge any longer. So they're actually adhering to a calorie deficit. So that's usually what happens. So in regards to energy availability, uh, this is a different animal, completely separate to uh, increasing calories and seeing weight loss. But for the listeners who are unaware, energy availability simply refers to the net energy available after partitioning of dietary energy, uh, typically among the five major metabolic activities. So that's cellular maintenance, thermoregulation, locomotion, growth and reproduction. So the use of energy for one function will mean that uh, it's unavailable for others. And this is where energy availability has really come to surface of late because when we have athletes who are exercising, so performing a lot of locomotion, uh, they're using up a significant amount of energy they're on low calorie intakes, which means they don't have enough energy for reproduction. So very common in uh, female athletes. And as it stands, there's a body of research building in this area and it's looking to be quite compelling. Uh, and the validity of energy availability theory as being one of the primary uh, reasons for hormonal disorders, which is what most people are interested in at the moment, uh, is, yeah, as I said, quite compelling. So the other hypothesis uh, that it's stress-related or body composition-related, but uh, yeah, Anlock is looking into uh, energy availability as being the reason uh, behind the reproductive uh, down-regulation when we have low energy intakes and high energy outputs. So I hope I answered that question for you. Question number six. In a bulking phase, eating in a surplus on training days and maintenance calories on rest days, is that a good idea to minimize fat gain while maximizing hypertrophy? Or are you putting yourself in a position for submaximal growth? Good question, Chris. And I for sure think this can be beneficial uh, if it improves your adherence and is something that you prefer. A lot of people love the complexity of having high and low day structures within uh, their week and altering their calorie intakes on their training days and rest days or weekends and work days, whatever the case may be, but provided the rate of gain is uh, appropriate over the course of the week, so not looking to your scale weight on a daily basis when you're trying to build muscle, because muscle, uh, will, muscle growth will take a lot longer than fat loss, so we need to look at averages over weeks and months. As long as you're gaining weight at an appropriate rate, so generally between 0.5 to 1.5% of body weight per month. Uh, it shouldn't matter too much, provided you're at a small surplus at the end of the week, at the end of the month, because again, the training stimulus will be what leads to muscle growth. Your nutrition will simply augment uh, the muscle protein synthetic response that you're getting from lifting weights. So it's not going to make too much of a difference. However, I will mention that most people who fear fat gain and alter their dieting strategies uh, during gaining phases to minimize fat Gain, uh, do so 
simply because they're afraid of gaining weight. And when you're in a gaining phase, the objective is to gain weight. So you shouldn't be too concerned with seeing some fat gain. That's by a byproduct of being at a calorie surplus and it will ensure that you're at a body fat percentage that allows you to train productively, you can recover well, and gives you a great amount of predictability in your training performance. So don't expect to see lean gains all the time. You're going to gain a bit of fat, you might lose a little bit of definition, and you might not be a six pack lean or Instagram lean, but the reality is building muscle takes time and you will gain some body fat uh, at being in a surplus over time. Now. This is where you can incorporate periods of maintenance, you can do cutting phases and things like that. But the reality is you need to invest in your gaining phases and that means embracing fat gain. So if you're trying to minimize fat gain, uh, a slower rate of loss is going to do that. Uh, and whether you achieve that with a linear structure in your calories or you undulate your calories across the week, it's not gonna make too much of a difference. But just make sure you're gaining an appropriate rate across the weeks and months. Question number seven. Hi Jacob, I was wondering about strength loss when losing weight. I understand that it won't be the same in terms of how it manifests itself at all, but would it ever be sudden rather than gradual and affect one lift, not others? I'm asking because in the last two weeks, as I hit my target weight, my squat has dropped off five to 10 kilos, but my other lifts are still going well. Could that be weight loss related or more likely technique or a combination of both? So this is a question from Claire, and this is a really good question because it's very common for people to lose strength uh, when they're losing weight, but it's not always the case, and it doesn't need to be that way unnecessarily. But strength loss when you're cutting uh, is common, and how much strength you do lose uh, during a cut will be dependent on a number of factors. So firstly, the magnitude of the calorie deficit. So if you're at a small calorie deficit, you're know, anywhere from 10 to 20% below maintenance, you shouldn't see that large uh, a drop in strength, initially at least. Uh, but if you're dieting with pretty low calorie intakes and the deficit is quite large, so you know 30% or more, then it's inevitable that your strength will drop off, uh, which brings us to the second factor to consider, which is the duration of the calorie deficit. So how long you've been dieting for as well. So if you've only been dieting for four weeks and you're already losing strength, I would dare say that that's a programming error and you're probably not recovering well. Uh, or your deficit's too large, but four weeks for the most part, you shouldn't really see too much strength loss. If you've been dieting for six months, 12 months, then definitely you will expect to see some uh, loss in your strength. And the third factor is the total amount of weight that you have lost. If you've lost a small percentage of your body weight, then again, you shouldn't expect to see any strength loss uh, at all if your program is on point. If you lose a significant portion of your body weight, uh, you know, typically 10% or more, then you can definitely expect to see a reduction in your strength. It's unfortunate, but you're a smaller person now and you're eating less food, you're not going to be able to pre perform the same kind of uh, you know, strength that you have previously, and it will take some time to build up your strength at your new body weight uh, generally. So just remember that. And the fourth factor is your experience training during uh, energy restriction. So if you're a first time dieter and you've just started cutting and you've lost a bit of weight, you've spent a few weeks, maybe months at a calorie deficit, yeah, it's gonna to be tough to get your head around training and be able to bring the heat when you're in the gym and you're performing those hard working sets towards the back end of a mesocycle. But if you're somebody like me who spent the better part of my uh, teenage years uh, eating like 1800 calories, uh, when I train in a calorie deficit, it really doesn't affect my performance too much. Uh, I can you know, lift similar weights for the most part until I get well below my settling point. So that's really important to keep in mind. The fifth factor is the lift itself. So some exercises you will see greater decreases in your strength than you will in others. Typically upper body uh, pushing movements, we're gonna see our strength drop off first. Your lower body exercises should be the last uh, lifts that you see your strength drop. And I know you mentioned uh, you lost five to 10 kilos in uh, your squats when you've been dieting. And I would say that's potentially a programming uh, issue rather than uh, a diet related issue. But again, you have to look through those aforementioned factors to assess whether or not it is diet related or maybe it's just training related. So make sure you take into account those things and 
Again, sometimes when we diet, we need to adjust our expectations, especially if we lose a lot of weight, have been dieting for a long time, and we're not very experienced uh, with diet uh, training during an energy deficit. So I hope I answered that one for you, Claire. Question number eight is from Evan. I'm really considering and wanting to open up my own facility and wondered if you had any tips on how I would go about this. Like when do you think is the right time to do it? Any particular approaches you took? Any huge issues you had doing it? Well, where do I begin? I love when people ask me about opening a facility. I feel like I could write a book on this and tell you all of the things that I did wrong and all the mistakes I made. Uh, so hopefully I can share some of them with you and you can avoid those mistakes because uh, a very wise man, my grandfather taught me that a wise man learns from his own mistakes, but an even wiser man learns from the mistakes of others. So if you can learn from my mistakes, you're, you're wiser than I am. So my biggest tip is uh, if you're going to open your own place and you have the capital to buy the facility, then do it. There's a reason McDonald's are successful because they don't just have burger shops, they also have land. Uh, so yeah, I would recommend uh, buying the facility if you can, but I know that for many people that's out of the question, so you're probably going to have to lease. Uh, think about how far the facility you're going to lease is from your current location because if it's too far, you could potentially lose a lot of clients. So you want to make sure that it's in within close proximity uh, to where you're currently working so that you have a good base of clientele when you open up the doors. Uh, there is no right time to open a gym. I think to address the question, uh, you know, is there a right time to do it? There is no right time. You, you have to be confident that the decision to expand and venture out on your own will result in a favorable outcome. So whatever your definition of success is should dictate whether it's going to be a good decision and that's largely up to you. I can't tell you that. Uh, if financial uh, gains are your definition of success, then opening a facility will mean you're going to have a lot more overheads, a lot more expenses. So you're going to need more clients and you have to think about other ways you're going to generate uh, revenue and income, uh, but if your definition of success is independence and autonomy and creating your own space and all those sorts of things, then for sure opening a facility uh, can be a way that you can achieve that. Uh, but again, consider your current client base, the likelihood of them following you to your own space, uh, the competition in the area, and how you're going to finance the operation. So think about how you're going to run the facility. Really do a thorough assessment of all the things that you're going to need to have in place to, to run your business. You're going to need obviously your lease, you're going to have to have insurance, your operating costs, your outgoings, all those sorts of things. The expenses really do uh, pile up. You're going to need to get equipment. If you buy equipment, you better have uh, you know, a good chunk of money saved up. Uh, otherwise, leasing the equipment is an alternative, but I don't recommend that. But if you are going to take the leap, I recommend having a contingency plan so that if things don't work out, uh, you know, you're in a position where you can transition back to another facility or a different career path. You've got to have an out because it is risky business uh, starting a new business. Not many uh, new companies or personal trainers last when they open up a facility or they do open up a facility and they spend years and years spinning their wheels. Uh, but my advice to yeah, really make sure that it's, it's a good decision and a safe decision is to make sure that you've, you've got an out so you don't dig yourself a hole you can't climb out of. Question number nine is from David. Uh, with Christmas time uh, here, few people starting their fitness journeys and wanting to diet now. So if they're motivated to diet now, how do you design a diet program that allows them to get results and buy in early despite uh, a huge increase in socializing and changes in lifestyle that make adhering to their diet hard. So this is a really interesting question. I think if you're motivated to diet now, uh, even though the time of year is such that it's not conducive to dieting, reconsider whether or not you are going to follow the diet because you will set yourself up for failure despite high motivation to, to diet and get leaner, so on and so forth. So. I would just aim to use the next couple of weeks to start building some habits and getting things ready for, for the diet when all the festivities are out of the way. 
So what I like to do with my clients is over the Christmas period, usually it's a 10 to 14 day break for most people, I will set them a diet break where they just focus on their behaviors and their mindset. So focusing on getting protein in, enjoying their food, making sensible decisions, so eating like an adult and being able to enjoy food both during the moment when they're eating it, but also feeling good about the decisions they make afterwards, and then making sure that they're not fatigued, not stressed out, feeling really guilty when the new year rolls around and they're ready to diet. So yeah, have a diet break, aim to maintain your weight or at least control the rate of gain. And there is some research that has found that people gain around 500 grams over the Christmas period. And the problem with this is that they don't lose it. So having a set start date when you're going to resume your regular training and potentially a fat loss phase after the Christmas period is important and making sure that any weight that is gained uh, does come off and then some is is vital to uh, your long-term progress and provided you don't gain too much, it shouldn't be an issue. But for the most part, make sure your clients are able to enjoy their their Christmas with their friends and family or whatever the holiday period is for them, uh, guilt-free and just focus on getting the behaviors set and laying the foundations for what will be a successful diet uh, when all the changes in circumstance and lifestyle start to settle down and a little bit of normalcy returns to their schedule. Uh, question number 10 is from uh, a lady and I forgot to record her name, but she asked, volume slash progressive overload. She's seen posts by Brett Contreras, for example, that would display a client who does no more than 10 sets per workout and performs basic lifts to make incredible changes to their physiques. This is after reducing volume significantly and focusing on overloading each week and session. But then I see research that indicates more volume equals more hypertrophy, which equals a better physique. Can you offer any clarity? So firstly, I can't really comment on Brett's approach as I'm not overly familiar with his exact protocols. Uh, what I do know is he gets his girls strong as fuck. So he does a good job. But I think, uh, yeah, I'll address the observation that reducing volume uh, allows his clients to improve their physique. So this is likely due to the fact that their prior training volume was too high, so they weren't recovering, weren't adapting, their technique was poor, and there was no progression implemented into their training. So basically, they were just training with lots of volume. It was pretty average training, and there was no logic or structure to it. So in these situations, when you strip back volume to establish a baseline, you refine technique, and you implement a basic progression model, magic happens and people start making awesome progress and they see a lot of change uh, very, very quickly. So that's what I suspect to be the case uh, with Brett's reducing the volume. And in many cases, this is what I do with my clients and athletes. If they come to me and they you know, have technique that's a little bit off and they need refining and they've been following stupidly crazy programs with lots of volume, I pull things back and we build a base. And there are some pretty impressive results that occur during these phases. But as you mentioned, the, the research does indicate that there's a dose-response relationship between hypertrophy uh, uh, and training volume. So meaning, for those of you who might not be uh, familiar with this concept, more volume equals more growth up until a point, and then it starts a flat line and you get diminishing returns. So when we talk about adding more volume, it's important to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples and we're all understanding what volume means because there's many definitions, but the most simplest and relevant and practical way to define volume is the number of hard working sets per week, per muscle group with an appropriate intensity of effort. So as measured by RPE, so rate of perceived exertion, this would typically mean an RPE of seven or more. So you could do maybe three reps. So you've got to train hard with uh, a certain number of sets per week per muscle group. So is we need to understand that if we add volume, what, what does that mean? Well, not all volume is created equally. A set of squats at an RP of seven is gonna be very different to a set of leg extensions at an RP of seven. Number of joints involved, uh, obviously the amount of stabilizing muscles, all those sorts of things is gonna create a huge discrepancy in the amount of fatigue that we're placing, or stress rather, that we're placing on the body. So volume will cause fatigue because it's highly correlated with fatigue. So increasing volume will mean that we increase fatigue. But adding more volume doesn't always mean more gains because you need to be able to recover from that volume. So if we're training with a certain volume, recovering, and we're adapting, so we're seeing progress week to week in our strength uh, across higher repetition ranges on multiple sets and exercises, 
then we probably don't need to add volume. But if you're recovering and you're not seeing progression from week to week or as you would expect given your level of advancement, you might need to add in a little bit more volume. But the problem is people add volume when they're already making progress and then they start to under recover or they're already under recover and they add more volume. So what's, what's critical to remember is that we have what's known as the SRA model, so the Stimulus Recovery Adaptation Model. So when we train, we impose a stress, a stimulus, and then after we train, we recover and we see uh, a decrement in our ability to perform because the body is repairing against all the damage that occurred. And then over time, we get adaptation. But remember, we don't get adaptation if we don't recover. So adding more volume uh, can mean that you're going to add more fatigue, which means you need more recovery resources. And if you're not recovering, you're not going to positively adapt. So just keep that in mind. And I wanted to add that uh, to this discussion so that you guys can better understand what volume is, what it means, and obviously uh, how that impacts our ability to progress. And just remember that mechanical tension is what causes muscle growth uh, and volume is simply exposure to tension. So I hope I answered that question for you. And if you guys have any further comments on that, feel free to comment below. And that is all for this Q&A, guys. Thank you very much for listening. If you have questions for next month's Q&A, feel free to ask, send me an email, contact me on Instagram or Facebook, and I'll gladly answer your questions. So this will be the final uh, podcast episode for 2018. Thank you all for tuning in throughout the year. And if you've just started listening, I appreciate you joining us, and I'll speak to you all soon. Have a very Merry Christmas. I'll catch you next time.